and I'm happy to um, have a chance to interview one of my very valued colleagues um, today who is uh, probably very well known to many of you um, as one of the most prominent uh, entrepreneurs from Berlin with one of the biggest exits that we have seen here so far, uh, selling daily deal to Google a couple of years ago for more than $100 million and um, today working for a fantastic uh, VC company called Early Bird. And um, I hope that uh, we will have a chance to um, give you guys an interesting evening tonight. So to kick it off, um, Fabian, from your point of view, like having founded and invested in more than 30 businesses, what makes up a great idea? And when do you say, hey, this is really great, this has a lot of potential? So what makes up a great idea? Um, honestly, um, building companies that can really sustain in the long term as a standalone profitable business over time. This is what today for me defines a good idea and what I'm um, looking for out there as an investor. Speaking of the filtering that you already mentioned, you need a big market, you need a great team, you need uh, an ambitious idea behind it. How would you evaluate the common process? Spotting a company like Papaya, let's stick with the example, how could somebody like a VC firm like Early Bird um, help them with their vision? Because when you pick them, you invest into a very, very, very small company with low ambitions, maybe small markets. And how do you develop it over time? So is there a common approach from your, from your perspective, how you can help founders to actually come up with the bigger ideas and bigger schemes? Yeah. That's actually a good and also somewhat tricky question because if we um, have the um, um, the impression that the founder team like completely lacks a five a ten year kind of end game scenario big vision, then usually they are not the right guys for us. It's 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 not what we're looking for. Um, but there are um, but the lines are blurred and and there are teams um, which have a very strong idea about what they are doing today and maybe in two, three years, and that indeed, with a little bit of help, <coughs> get to the setup that we need. And speaking of specialization, which is something that I believe in as well, um, you were saying that you're hedging your risk a little bit by going into different focus areas. Would you also recommend something <coughs> like that on the entrepreneur side? So is there a secret sauce from your point of view on how can you actually make your idea successful? One of the nicest um, or, or maybe also most fulfilling ways is if you actually make your hobby or your passion your business. That is a sweet spot. However, not many passions make up for a great business. Yeah. So um, to be completely honest with you, when my brother and I started um, our first business businesses back in 2008, failed a couple of times. Um, um, once in Stanford, but then also uh, twice in Germany. Team broke apart, uh, but didn't get funding and so on. And this was also quite opportunistically. And then essentially the process that led to the foundation of Daily Deal was driven by a very analytical and structured approach saying, okay, we failed now a couple of times. We're basically bankrupt. We had to freelance at Zalando and so on. To, we were sharing one bed, one desk. It was really like at the minimum rock bottom level where you could, could, could be. Yeah. And so we said, okay, how can we optimize for getting just getting off the ground, starting a business now that kind of works at least. Yeah? And so we said, um, let's set passion um, aside um, to some extent and let's just really look for a business model that has a proof of concept in some other market, be it in Asia, be it in, in, in the US, um, and that we can bring to, to, to Germany and Europe and that simply has a high likelihood of being adopted somehow. So this was our approach given our situation back in the days. Yeah? And, um, and so we went really top down, almost kind of McKinsey style, um, developed a scorecard and looked at market sizes and value chains and, and so on. And, um, and out of a long list of, of models that we kind of saw somewhere or, or discovered and, and scored, then Daily was basically top of the list. So we said, okay, let's do that. Let's, let's build online marketing customer acquisition for offline SMBs. This was essentially, I mean, Daily Deal is the brand, but what was the idea behind it? It was doing what Google did for online to online, moving traffic from A to B, generating leads for online shops. Nobody could do that at the time for offline SMBs. They were advertising on yellow pages and, 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 and radio and out of home and flyer and whatnot. Huh? So this was the idea saying, let's bring online marketing uh, channel for a new customer acquisition uh, by selling vouchers on a B2C marketplace. Let's bring that to Germany and to Europe. And so we did. And, um, and, and in that sense, it was really, um, it was just a, a structured analytic approach that took us there. Um, 
later, um, for example, st staying on the entrepreneurial side, when after we sold the company to Google and then started the investment business while still working for Google, it was my brother and I running five, six businesses, including investment business at the same time. Can't work. Can't work. Focus. So you focused. And, um, and so we learned over a period of two, two and a half years, we learned really the hard way. So if you can do one thing better than everybody else, you create 10, 100 times more value than being okay good at a couple of things. Focus, focus, focus. So it took us two and a half uh, years uh, to learn. If you're, if you're speaking to university students today and if you're having young, young entrepreneurs in front of you, how would you recommend to them to find an idea? Your, your experience today is obviously giving you a different kind of advice, but how would you recommend uh, a young university student to approach starting a company? So I would, I would still start with what excites me. So a little bit like what's my passion, but more what excites me and which problems. I mean, at the end of the day, each, each product that a startup builds is about solving a problem. If it doesn't solve a problem, there's no market, there's no willingness to pay, there's no business. It's philanthropy or hobby or whatever, but it's not a business. So what excites me? Um, which problems do I experience or people that surround me, um, which are big? Um, where I would have a willingness to pay for getting a solution um, and where I see really a purpose in solving those problems. If, um, if you find something in that space, that is to me, that's the ideal, um, that's the ideal way of finding an idea. Um, it's, it's not guaranteed though that this approach will succeed, um, even if you put it in a certain analytical framework. Yeah? And if that doesn't work, then in the old days, uh, what, what people did um, it was basically go to a company builder like Rocket Internet and say, okay, here I am, I'm ready to work hard, I can excel, I can PowerPoint, I can work 14 hours. Give me the idea, give me the money and give me the tech guys. This is how it worked in the old days. And sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. Um, so today, um, as the kind of company and incubator models, um, I, I would say, are, are um, not retiring, but, but are ha not having the same output and traction at the, as they had a couple of years ago, because a couple of years ago it was indeed a lot of copy-paste from US to Europe and then from Europe to uh, Southeast Asia and other um, um, less developed markets. Um, this is kind of run, this worked good for, for e-commerce and marketplace and for some consumer fintech, but this is, they are kind of running out of ideas. Now, there's just not so many models that you can copy so easily and just stuff a talent uh, that's willing to execute hard up on it. And that's good. That's good from an entrepreneurial uh, standpoint, from an, from an idea and, 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 and creative standpoint, um, because it forces people to actually really think about what they do and think about the problems they solve and, uh, and not just focus up on executing really hard on something that maybe doesn't even have the value or the purpose behind it um, and where you don't really uh, don't really have the intrinsic connection to do it and um, I'd, I'd be curious to hear what, how, how you think about it because um, I think starting a consumer internet company is a low-hanging fruit in the way that you have a mobile app store and have global distribution from day one and you can just get to your customers it, it seems as if over the last 10 years however the consumer internet uh, internet of course is not empty but the cases that can become global winners are decreasing. decreasing. So we are entering an era where probably enterprise or SMB SaaS and uh, B2B businesses in general are most likely going to increase in size and like right. consumer companies are going to decrease. So for a student, however, to start a B2B company without any network and the knowledge on how to sell a product to an enterprise client is probably going to be way more difficult, right? So what's going to happen with young people that have ideas to start internet businesses? Basically applied a somewhat um, 2.0 approach of what we had applied back in the days with Daily Deal. So try to combine kind of passion or interest um, and opportunity. So I have access into that industry, which we had. I was living a long time in Hamburg. We had very deep access into shipping and transportation and, and freight and could, could really understand the problems of the incumbent players and the problems of the shippers. When you, when, kind of where, where your interest intersects with your opportunity, with opportunity that you have because you have proprietary access or insight and where that intersects kind of with your talent or a DNA as a team, yeah? Where, where those three circles intersect, I think that is where you want to be, where you want to build a business and where you can actually go with a certain level of predictability that, that you will find a good opportunity there. Let, let's talk a little bit about unit economics because when, when I 
came to the ecosystem and you came to the ecosystem, the concept was already well known and like it was, you know, you would pay attention to it. But my feeling is it is getting even more important today because you just have a bigger choice of good deals. So you will pay more attention to it. So can you talk a little bit about unit economics, what they are, what they are made of and why you would pay so much attention to it? Yeah, I mean, this is a, a broad field um, because unit economics or K KPIs in general and, and, and KPI benchmarks and then unit economics as, as a subset of, of, of them, I will, so I would frame it, um, uh, are, are very specific by business model. So uh, again, in e-commerce or in a um, kind of straight down model, um, it's completely different things that, that matter to you than in a two-sided marketplace where you need to su scale supply and demand at the same time, um, or in a SaaS model where you have where you look more on the on the recurring revenue side. Um, so it's really it's really specific by um, by business model, and um, and it's really also a bit specific to the DNA of the investor. I would say so. So still in the when you look into the US, there's many more investors that have this kind of cowboy um, uh, attitude, which are really willing over many stages and with hundreds of millions of funding to, f to, to keep f financing businesses that are highly loss-making and sometimes even on gross margin loss-making because they simply have this strong belief in first conquering the market, um, putting everybody out of the business who's around, and then once you own the market, then you can start making money, raising prices, earning. Yeah? This is basically how a lot of the um, Silicon Valley companies have gained global um, prevalence and global domination in their space because they find these guys on the West Coast who are just up for this game yeah? and who are, who, who, who are uh, completely fearless in that sense. Europe, pretty different and especially do, do Germany. Do you think this could yeah. be because of the competitive environment in Europe? Because like there are not too many funds, right? Like of course there's like early birds and e-ventures and there are a couple of others, but it's not as competitive. So you wouldn't drop a term sheet just overnight. So you take more time yeah. to evaluate a company instead of just doing the cowboy thing. Now, this may be one reason. Um, it's a bit of a sign of kind of the, the German DNA of being less, uh, less uh, prone to, to, to taking huge risks, of being more of an kind of the engineering way, the, the kind of prudent way, two steps forward, one step back, kind of incremental optimization rather than going the Peter Thiel from zero to one <coughs> way. Yeah? So, so in a sense, um, um, I think our DNA in the, in the ecosystem is giving us a hard time in building global champions and we have to. So, so I think, I, my opinion is this is not a matter of you can do it this way, you can do it that way, it can lead to the same success. I think there's really a good, a right or wrong or a better or worse. And, 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 and just the, the fact, um, uh, um, or just looking at the output of the US ecosystem, I think, um, hands down, we have to learn from those guys. And we have to make bolder bets and, um, and this conquer and then earn, yeah, um, this approach in many markets, it simply works. Um, let's let's start. We still have a couple of minutes left uh, for for your questions. Uh, wouldn't you say that perhaps in five years or ten years, fifteen years, we will or entrepreneurs will run out of problems that uh, are profitable solving? Uh, and I guess the other statement of the question: What do you think is the greatest challenge for entrepreneurs in five to ten years? I think you, you want to look at um, you want to look at the the, uh, the entrepreneurial potential on a sector by sector level. Yeah? So, for example, travel, it's over, it's over. As ninety nine percent of the market are addressed with super state of the art, um, um, a, a super high customer satisfaction travel companies for any mode, um, you will find something great out there. E commerce. Same thing. You can do some 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 niche games, yeah. Um, but but the the mass market um, for 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 digital retail, it's addressed. There's company out there that captured it. There's no point in 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 starting businesses in those areas with the ambition of building something really big. You can build a nice lifestyle business, a niche business, but I'm talking really about big transformative. So these two industries, 
uh, started um, uh, being tackled by digital entrepreneurs in the 1990s. It took 10, 15 years, 20 years, and then a lot of consolidation. And now you have some some few leading players, and um, and it's kind of it's kind of the, the most advanced in, in in terms of digitization. But there's 25 other big industries who are somewhere in between, like almost zero um, or um, almost 100%. And, um, and until um, we run out of problems to solve in the sense that all industries are completely um, um, digitally transformed um, um, in a way that retail and travel are, are today, I think this is easily going to take 20 or maybe even 30 years. And um, suggest um, also um, get, getting a big picture about the, the kind of mega trends, yeah, which you could define um, uh, in, in very simplified again. Like for the last 10 years, we were working on the transition from desktop to cloud, desktop to cloud software. We were working on the transition of uh, kind of desktop application on consumer from desktop to mobile. Yeah. Now we are working on um, on replacing um, repetitive manual tasks by AI and by robotic process optimization. I mean, we can talk about VR and, and, and AR, which is, for example, not an area where we are particularly active. Um, you can talk about mobility and transportation, which is an area I'm, I'm very excited about, shared, um, electrified, autonomous, and all the IoT and, and software hardware combinations that, that are really uh, suited uh, to be built out of Germany with all the incumbent uh, know-how in, in the, in the uh, automotive sector we have here. A very, very fertile breeding ground. Yeah. So look at those mega trends and try to kind of position and get an idea where it is on the curve. Yeah. And, and, and this is basically, uh, this is the way to do it. And, and then again, try to match that with what you're intrinsically um, interested in, what you're passionate about, where, where you have an opportunity or kind of an un unfair advantage in your team um, uh, co uh, DNA team configuration, and off you go. And then it's also a little bit a matter of luck, period. I agree. I think uh, we have come to an end. We are already 15 minutes over the time. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for being here tonight. And of course, thank you very much uh, to my guests for joining us. I think it's great that you are sharing your experiences with everyone, and we will make it available online, and you can uh, follow it on SoundCloud and Overcast, YouTube, and iTunes. I can heavily invite everyone to uh, follow Startup Notes, where the content will be made available. I think sharing experiences and, and knowledge and insights is something uh, that the startup world is also all about. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to hosting the next lecture on uh, May 17th uh, with my valued colleague uh, and your valued colleague, Uwe Horstmann from Project A Ventures. Um, so uh, join us again and uh, have a beautiful evening. And thank you very much for coming tonight. Thank you. Thank you.